Signs of a stock market crash are nothing new. Stocks have surged 87% from last year's low, and tech stocks are up almost 900% since the 2008 crash. Even the investors that are always optimistic about stocks, the so-called permables, are calling for a stock market collapse. In this video, I'm gonna show you the three factors leading to the next stock crash, then reveal the trap door that could set it all off. I'll then show you three things you need to do with your money right now to not only protect it, but to make sure it keeps growing. We're talking stock market crashes today on Let's Talk Money. Hey Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here with the Let's Talk Money channel. I wanna send a special shout out to all you out there in the nation. Thank you for spending a part of your day to be here. If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. Nation, after a 12 year bull market, stocks are undeniably expensive. Here's a chart of the P ratio, the price investors are paying for every dollar in earnings at nearly an all-time high of 31 times. To put that into perspective, the blue dashed line here is the 10-year average at about 19 times price to earnings. That means investors right now are paying 63% more for stocks than they have over the past decade. Stocks are two-thirds more expensive than they have been in the past. But now all you out there in the nation know, I usually say you shouldn't try to time the market. And one of the greatest investors of all time, Peter Lynch, has a great quote here saying that more money has been lost by investors trying to anticipate a crash, selling stocks ahead of time, than has actually been lost in the crashes themselves. That calm, buy and hold strategy works in the best of times as well as the worst. And this channel isn't about scaring you into making those snap decisions with your money. But... This market is flashing some massive warning signs and one factor that has preceded nearly every single stock market crash just reached a record. This is something you cannot ignore and there's a very real reason you need to take this seriously. Nation, it took an average of 24 months for the market to recover from the last 12 bear market crashes since 1946. That's two years before stock prices regained their peak, but that average masks a very real possibility that it could take much, much longer. It took more than 14 years after the dot-com bubble burst for the market to recover, and after the crash of 1929, the market didn't see a new high for 25 years. That means if you have less than 10 years left to needing your money, you cannot afford to see half of it wiped out when stocks crash. Even for those of you with longer to invest though, you need to protect your money or potentially face returns that will fail to reach your goals. Morningstar just released its annual market forecast survey with most major banks forecasting returns of less than 5% a year over the next decade. In fact, Morningstar is predicting negative returns and the research affiliates is forecasting investors are gonna lose money on the US stocks after accounting for inflation. Worse still though, that trapdoor under stocks I'm gonna be revealing later in this video could amplify those losses in a market crash, causing you to lose much more than any other crash in history. In this video, I'll show you those three factors putting stocks in danger and then reveal the trapdoor that could cause it all to come crumbling down. I'll then show you three things you can do right now to protect your money and keep it working for you. And Nation, the first factor here is just the era of easy money is coming to an end. Now between the Federal Reserve and the government, more than $10 trillion has been pumped into the system over the last year. Just the Fed alone has pushed $4 trillion into the economy. And if you need any idea of how that affects stocks, this graph shows the money printing frenzy in red against the Wilshire 5000, which is it's the total stock market index. And you can't look at this and tell me the Fed doesn't move the market. But now using the FedWatch tool created by the CME, we can see the market is forecasting a 34% chance that the Fed raises interest rates by a half a percent or more by December of next year. And I think that's likely underestimating the rate increases and the taper of the $120 billion the central bank is still pumping into the economy. That means higher interest rates, slower economic growth, and money coming out of an inflated market. Factor number two here that's gonna contribute to that stock market crash is the fact that stocks are just ridiculously expensive. And yes, understand that bull markets don't die because stocks get expensive, but, but when they get to these levels, it makes it possible that any small market scare, any catalyst at all can turn into a crash. With stocks so expensive, anything that spooks the market is just gonna be much more likely to turn in that rush into the exits. And yes, earnings are surging after the pandemic and that's bringing down those PE ratios gradually, but, but even using the forward PE ratios, so these are the dark blue bars here, that's the price of stocks in each sector divided by the expected earnings over the next year versus the 10-year average PE ratio in green. And you can see 
every single sector is trading at a premium to its long-term average. Now, the third factor here, pushing stocks towards that crash before we get to the trapdoor that could set it all off, is corporate bond defaults in China. Now, bond defaults in China have reached a record high this year to almost $10 billion in the first half alone. And I know you wouldn't normally think this has anything to do with the US markets, but China is now a fifth of the entire global economy at $16 trillion. It's still smaller than the US GDP of $22 trillion, but, but investors can no longer ignore what's happening in China because that does affect the global economy. 25 companies defaulted on their loans in the first half alone versus just 19 in the same period last year. And, and what makes this especially dangerous is, is we're in the middle of an unprecedented economic recovery with low rates and cheap money globally. Now, if this is happening now, what happens when conditions aren't as good? You know, how many bond defaults does China see then and, and could it cause another global depression? Now again, none of these three factors makes a stock market crash inevitable. Uh, stocks don't fall just because they get expensive or when the Fed starts raising rates. That historic bull market could keep going if not for one big threat. Now this could be the potential straw that breaks the camel's back. The butterfly that lands on your car teetering over the cliff and sends it crashing over. Nation, if you look back at the previous stock market crashes, every one, every single one has been preceded by a run in margin debt. That's the amount borrowed by investors to bet on stocks. And what's most interesting about this chart is you see margin debt as a percentage of the economy on the top here. What's interesting here is as investors borrow more money to juice those stock market returns, the crashes get even bigger. Here you see back in the 60s and 70s, margin debt never made it above 1% of GDP, 1% the size of the economy, and the crashes in those years were relatively light. Fast forward though to 99 and 2007 when investors were borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars and debt was more than 2% the size of the economy, that's when we saw those crashes of 50% and more on stocks. But now if we bring this forward to today, look at the explosion in margin debt. As of April, borrowing to invest in stocks hit a new all-time high of $847 billion per Yardini research. Now that's nearly 4% the size of the economy and margin debt has doubled since 2013. Even scarier here though is just the speed of that increase in borrowing. Margin debt rose 80% in the year before the dot-com bubble burst. It spiked 60% in the year before the financial crisis. And over the past year, margin debt has jumped 60% with investors borrowing more than $300 billion on stocks. And then why this could become that catalyst that causes a massive stock market crash is because on any news or any event that makes stocks fall just a little, this margin debt is gonna amplify those losses. If stocks, for example, fall by as little as 5%, maybe even 10%, that's gonna mean brokers send out those margin calls, requiring investors to put up more money or sell their stocks. And it just becomes a downward spiral where stocks fall, margin debt forces more selling, and stocks fall further. Nation, most stock market crashes start from some unforeseen event, a black swan, if you will, that, that shocks the market into a five or a 10% correction. But it's these factors that we've talked about that turn that event into a full-blown crash, where stocks just keep on falling from 30 and 40% and more. Now that you know the danger facing the market right now though, the question becomes, how do you protect your money and prepare your portfolio? And again, I'm not suggesting you try to time the market, jumping in and out of stocks. It's a losing game and you end up missing out on those returns. What I wanna show you here though is three strategies that are gonna keep growing your portfolio but at the same time still protect you from the worst of the stock market crash when it comes. And first here is just gonna be rebalancing your portfolio across assets as well as stock sectors. And this means selling some of your assets like stocks that have done really well over the past year and putting that money in bonds or real estate or even cryptocurrencies. So here you're just selling a portion of your stocks to spread that money and the risk into different assets. You can do that same thing within stocks as well by taking some of that money that you made in tech stocks or communication services over that huge huge run last year, taking some of that and putting it in other sectors. If we look at this sector PE ratio chart again, we can see that stocks in consumer discretionary, technology, and industrials are hugely expensive. But then if we look on the right side of the graph here, stocks in financials, healthcare, and materials aren't nearly as expensive compared to those long-term averages. Basically, rebalancing is just that old idea of buy low and sell high. 
you're selling some of what is done really well and is expensive right now to buy more of what is still cheap. Another strategy to protect your portfolio is by using options to limit your risk in a stock. I like using the covered call strategy for this because I can collect cash on my stocks, limit some of that near-term downside risk, but then still keep the shares for that longer-term upside. A covered call strategy is where you own shares of a stock or a fund and then sell those call options against them. This means another investor is gonna pay you cash now for that right to buy the shares from you at a certain price over a certain period, usually from a few months to as long as a year out. And this is a strategy I've used on shares of Cisco and TiVo recently. I like Cisco for that long-term play on cloud computing and, and those other trends it's in, but I was a little bit worried about the near term. I bought shares at $39.50 each eh? and at the same time sold a call option at a strike price of $45 for a $3.65 premium. So now you see here, even though my shares are down 51 cents so, so, so far after buying them, the value of that call I sold is down to $3.37 each. So I actually made $2.86 per share or about 7% on the investment. Now, as long as shares of Cisco stay under $45 each over the next two months to January 15th, I'll keep that entire call premium or $364 and I'll keep the shares. So then the great thing about this covered call strategy is that even if the stock price falls, you're gonna keep that money collected on the options and you still keep the stock. That means you can sell more options against it, collecting more money, or just wait for the stock price to rebound. Now, the strategy can seem complicated at first, but it's a great way to lower your risk and cash flow of stock. So, so I'm gonna link to a full video on how to set it up in the video description below. Our third strategy here, and this is by far my favorite, but using some of your money from stocks to invest in a business or other income ideas. And I know this sounds weird coming from an investing channel, but the nation, the truth is, you just aren't getting paid that much in returns for the risk in the market right now. If we look back on that table of forecasted returns, you might make less than 4% a year on stocks over the next decade. Now, I don't know about you, but that is not enough return to meet my goals or, or even compensate me for that risk of the ups and downs in stocks. So now is the perfect time to invest in yourself or that business idea that you always wanted to start. Even if it means investing some of your portfolio money to get started, that, that return on an online business or any income stream is going to be far and away better than the 5 or, or the 10% return you might get on stocks. In fact, I'm going to link to another video, my five favorite passive income ideas, in the video description below to help you get started. Click on the video to the right for the top five safest monthly dividend stocks. Five stocks that are going to put cash in your pocket every single month, even if stocks crash. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.